This conference will now be recorded. This conference will now be recorded. Hello everyone, welcome to CM Dental Academy, an online dental education platform in the field of dental surgery. We aim at delivering excellent quality online training programs and courses for dental students under the guidance of eminent mentors. The subjects will be covered in all the formats such as live online lectures, descriptive notes, MCQs, and Viva Voice questions. So what are you waiting for? Come, let's begin a journey towards success. Myself, Dr. Mayuri Kulkarni Patil, MDS in Oral and Maxillofacial Pathology, at present course director at CM Dental Academy. So today's topic for discussion is going to be a dental caries. The previous year university question asked on this topic as define and classify dental caries, write in detail about the histopathology of dental caries. Before we begin with the session. I would just like to tell you all just I'll be noting down the important Viva Wars questions such as definitions, classifications or to the point uh, answers for the uh, asked during the Viva. So you just note them down so that you will be having at the end of session a collection of Viva Wars questions along with the answers. Most common and accepted definition of dental caries is as a microbial disease, irreversible microbial disease of the calcified tissues of the teeth characterized by demineralization of the inorganic part and destruction of the organic substance of the tooth, which often leads to cavitation. So whenever defined dental caries is being asked, this is going to be the standard definition to be answered. The word caries is derived from the Latin word, which means rot or decay. Clinical classification of dental caries. There is no any universally accepted or a standard classification for the dental caries, but it is it can be classified according to three basic factors mainly depending on the morphology, the dynamics involved and the chronology. According to the morphology or anatomical site of the lesion, the dental caries is classified as the pit and fissure caries, smooth surface caries, cervical caries, and root caries. Here is a picture showing the pit and fissure caries. Depending on the rate of carious progression, the process is classified as acute dental caries, which spreads rapidly or fast. The chronic dental caries is a long standing caries. Other variants of the dental caries, such as rampant caries, nursing bottle caries, recurrent caries, arrested caries, and radiation caries. Coming to the point, histopathology of dental caries. The principal manner in which caries of enamel has been studied is through the use of the ground section of the teeth that are usually between 60 to 100 microns in thickness. To study the enamel of the teeth, usually they are studied as the ground sections of the teeth though, with a thickness of 60 to 100 microns. Since the caries process is one involving the demineralization, the decalcification usually results in complete loss of enamel unless special methods are used. Uh, just for just to study the caries involving the enamel, whenever the ground sections are used during the demineralization process, the enamel will be totally lost. So it becomes very difficult to study the enamel. 
in such cases special methods are used caries of enamel most of the histological description of enamel caries is in relation to the early lesions enamel is the outermost covering of the tooth it is the hardest tissue in the entire body so whenever the caries process is involving the enamel obviously it is going to be the earliest lesion the caries process varies slightly depending on the occurrence of the lesion, whether it is a smooth surface or the pit and fissure surface, depending on its anatomical site where it occurs. Smooth surface caries, earliest microscopic evidence of incipient caries or the early caries on the Smooth surface is the appearance of an area of decalcification beneath the dental plaque. Below the dental plaque, there will be the first evidence or the sign being the area of decalcification, which resembles smooth chalky white area. It is best observed on an extracted tooth, usually at the cervical margin of the interdental facet and it is referred to as the white spot. The clinical appearance of the smooth surface caries initially appears as a white spot. The enamel surface overlying the white spot is hard and shiny and cannot be distinguished from the surface of the adjacent sound enamel with the explorer tip. Intact surface lesions may also appear brownish color due to the amount of exogenous material gets adsorbed onto the tooth surface. The study of early lesions by the transmission electron microscope has revealed that the first change is usually a loss of interprismatic or interrod substance of the enamel, which increases the prominence of the rod. So what happens here is first the interprismatic or the interrod substance. Enamel is formed of rods the interrod substance which is present in between the two rods first will be lost due to which there is increased prominence of the rods the cementing substance between the enamel rods will be lost and it, it leads to the prominence of the rods the initial roughening of the ends of the rod, enamel rods occurs due to which there will be accentuation of the incremental lines of regius. The incremental lines of regius of enamel becomes prominent. The striking appearance of regius lines is an optical phenomenon. An accentuation of perichymata. Perichymatas are nothing but the external manifestations of the incremental lines of regius. As this process advances, the smooth surface caries, particularly on the proximal surface, has a distinctive shape. As the caries advances on the smooth surface, they start to develop a distinct shape. It forms a triangular shape or a cone shape with its apex towards the dentino enamel junction and the base towards the surface of the tooth. There is an eventual loss of continuity of the enamel surface and it feels rough whenever an explorer is moved along the enamel surface. So these are the characteristic features of the smooth surface caries. How do they appear clinically and what happens at the microscopic level? Now let's we'll discuss about the pit and fissure caries. It differs from the smooth surface caries uh, based on the anatomical and histologically. The occlusal surface are deep invaginations of enamel that have been described as broad or narrow funnels, constricted hourglasses, multiple invaginations with inverted Y-shaped divisions, pits and fissures. So this is a picture showing a uh, fissure caries of the enamel, a ground section of a tooth is shown here. First, the caries enamel can be seen here, caries enamel in this picture, and the non-caries enamel, this one. The decalcification section of the tooth. In picture B, it illustrates the caries enamel. This is the caries enamel which is uh, not lost during the preparation of the section as is non-carious enamel. 
this is the non carious enamel this is all the carious enamel the point 1 and 2 being the carious enamel and this is the non carious lesion here there is a presence of enamel lamellae few authors have suggested that the enamel lamellae the area of weakness acts as a pathway for the invasion of the bacteria into the enamel which further leads to accumulation of plaque and uh, in uh, later stages they progress into the caries uh, the caries lesion starts along the fissure walls rather than at the surface it uh, gives the appearance of uh, chalkiness or yellow, brown or black discoloration. If the enamel in the bottom of the pit or fissure is thin, there will be rapid spreading of the pit and fissure caries. When caries occurs in pit and fissures, it follows the direction of the enamel rods and characteristically forms a triangular or cone shape, like how it is formed in the smooth surface caries. But here, it is exactly the opposite of its direction. The apex at the outer surface and base is towards the dentino enamel junction as the base is towards the dentino enamel junction the scary spreads along the dj in a lateral way greater number of dentinal tubules are involved when the lesion spreads along the dentino enamel junction they produce greater cavitation because uh, the caries process begins at the pits or the fissures its apex being also the pits and the fissures but they spread laterally as they reach dentino enamel junction they spread laterally so the base of the caries process is at the dentino enamel junction there is a more destruction occurring so it leads to the great cavitation below the pits or the fissures the caries lesion is more prone to be stained with brown pigmentation if in newly erupted teeth, br the brown stain is indicative of underlying decay, while in teeth of older individuals, it may be due to the arrested caries. Occasionally, enamel lamellae are found at the base of the pits and fissures, which I have shown you in a previous slide, how it affects the caries. In early stages, caries causes minimal damage to the outer smooth surface but considerable demineralization below the surface the initial lesion has been divided into different zones based on its histological appearance when the longitudinal ground sections are examined under the light microscope these are the four zones which are clearly distinguishable starting from the inner advancing front of the lesion. The first zone is the translucent zone, the dark zone, body of lesion, and the surface layer. Let's begin with the translucent zone. This lies at the advancing front of the enamel lesion, and it is not always present in uh, not all the carious lesions. So, it is observable when a longitudinal ground section is examined using an agent which is having a same refractive index that of enamel. Quinoline is suitable usually. So, when a ground section is examined in transmitted light after imbibition with the quinoline, the translucent zone appears structureless because the refractive index is same. The spaces or pores created in the tissue at this stage of enamel caries are located at prism boundaries and other junctional sites. Therefore, when the pores are filled with the medium having the same refractive index as enamel, normal structural markings are no longer visible. By means of polarized light, it has been shown that this zone is slightly more porous than the sound enamel, having a pore volume of 1%, while that of a sound enamel has 0.1%. The fluoride content of translucent zone enamel has to be shown to be increased than the sound enamel. Why it is increased is going to be the important fiber question. Please find out and drop me a message in chat box. The dark zone. It lies adjacent and superficial to the translucent zone. 
It is referred as the positive zone because it is always present. Usually it appears dark brown in ground sections. Polarized light studies have shown that dark zone has a pore volume of 2 to 4 percent when examined with the polarizing microscope after imbibition with quinoline. The dark zone shows positive birefringence in contrast to the negative birefringence of sound enamel. These effects have shown to be due to the presence of very small pores in the dark zone. Besides the relative large pores that are present in the first stage, the translucent zone. Therefore, when a ground section is examined in a mounting medium such as quinoline, the relatively large molecules of this medium are unable to penetrate the micropore system of the dark zone. Since the micropore remains unfilled with air or vapor, light is scattered on passing through the zone, causing brown discoloration of the dark zone. So very important Viva question asked why the dark zone appears so. The cause being the pores are the pores used to observe the dark zone using the medium are larger than the pore, uh, size of the pore formed in the dark zone. So they remain unfilled. There is a passing of the light and air which gives the appearance of dark zone. Here is a picture showing all the zones of the enamel caries, the surface zone, the body of lesion, the dark zone, and the translucent zone. As I have mentioned earlier, the translucent zone being the advancing front of the lesion above which or superficial to which there will be a dark zone. In a similar manner, the presence of medium or low refractive index within the micropore system is responsible for the reversal of birefringence when examined in polarized light. If the ground section is examined in an aqueous medium having a small molecule which penetrates the microspores, the dark zone is no longer seen because the refractive index of the medium used for the observation of the dark zone is similar to that of the pore size. It has been reported by some that the appearance of the dark zone was due to remineralization occurring at the advancing front of the lesion. The body of lesion. It lies between relatively unaffected surface layer and the dark zone. It is the area of greatest min, uh, demineralization compared to all the four zones, which is which zone is highly demineralized, that is the body of lesion. In polarized light, the zone shows a pore volume of 5% in spaces near the periphery, 25% in the center. When a longitudinal ground section is examined in quinoline with transmitted light, the body of lesion appears relatively translucent compared with the sound enamel. However, the stri of redzius within this region are well marked. In polarized light, after imbibition with water, the body of lesion shows as a region of positive birefringence in contrast to the sound enamel. Microradiographs confirm the reduced mineral content of this zone and a reduction of 24% mineral per unit volume compared to that of sound enamel and also a corresponding increase in unbound water and organic content due to the ingress of bacteria and saliva. The surface zone. The quantitative studies of the surface zone indicate a partial demineralization of about 1 to 4 percent, along with the pore volume of less than 5 percent of the species. After imbibing with the medium like water, although the porous subsurface zone is seen to be positively birefringent and the surface zone retains a negative birefringence. This relatively unaffected surface zone is also identifiable on microradiographs as it is sharply demarcated from the 
underlying radiolucent regions of the lesion. Thus, the surface zone when examined by the polarizing microscope has been defined as the zone of negative birefringence. Superficial to the positively birefringent body of lesion is seen when the section is examined in water. It is important to realize that all four histological zones of initial enamel lesion cannot be examined using a single medium. So to appreciate or to examine the different zones of enamel, we need to use different medium. The surface zone remains intact and also well mineralized because it is a site where calcium and phosphate ions are released by the surface dissolution becomes re-precipitated and leads to the remineralization. Once all the four layers of enamel caries are formed during demineralization process as the caries progress, the ions such as the calcium and the phosphate are released by the subsurface. They will reach to the surface layer and this ions becomes gets precipitated and helps in the remineralization of the surface layer. The high fluoride concentration of enamel surface would favor the remineralization. The surface zone is thus maintained at a relatively low level of demineralization through lesion formation and progression. Eventually, when the caries progression is rapid, where it fails to undergo the remineralization, the surface zone becomes demineralized, usually at a stage when lesion has penetrated some way into the dentine. Scott and Wyckoff reported that there is no direct relation between the occurrence of enamel lamellae and smooth surface queries on the basis of electron microscopic studies. So this is not yet been definitely proved that the enamel lamellae are the causative agents in caries formation and the progression. They have pointed out that in those caries in which lamellae appear to be associated with caries, the association is only by chance. Now we have seen what happens during the caries process microscopically, but now we'll see the ultrastructural changes in enamel caries. The scattered destruction of individual appetite crystals, both within the enamel prisms and at their boundaries occurs. The basic unit of enamel is the hydroxyapatite crystals. So the scattered destruction of these hydroxyapatite crystals occurs at the prism and at their boundaries, which further leads to progressive dissolution of the crystals, leads to the broadening of the intercrystalline spaces when seen in transverse sections. However, obvious spacing and damage to the crystals were not detectable unless the sections came from the areas having a pore volume of 10 to 25%, which was identifiable any in the body of the enamel carious lesion. High resolution electron microscope, carious dis uh, dissolution starts in the center of one end of the crystal and develops anisotropically along the lattice C axis. Anisotropic means it varies in the magnitude. Even it occurs along the axis, there will be difference in the magnitude. As the number of dissolved crystals increases, the densely calcified tissue becomes progressively more porous. In addition to crystal damage in the carious process, a different crystal form has been found at the prism border in carious enamel. During the entire process, it leads to a formation of different form of prism. These crystals at the prism boundary, they are large and isodiametric, electron dense than elsewhere. Their average size uh, being greater than the crystals in the sound enamel because there will be the release of all the ions, ions which leads to the larger and isodiametric electron dense crystals.
These larger crystals are thought to be the result of remineralization of the crystals that have resisted dissolution. Eventually, with the diffuse destruction of the appetite crystals, numerous bacteria can be observed invading the enamel lesion. So just to summarize all the lesions and the events occurring, starting with the translucent zone, it is the first recognizable zone of alteration. It is the advancing front of the lesion. Half the lesions demonstrate the translucent zone. Not necessarily it is present in all the carious lesions. Seen in longitudinal ground sections with the quinolone medium, refractive index being 1.62, it appears structureless, pore volume in this zone being 1%, compared to the sound enamel being 0.1%. Dark zone, it lies adjacent and superficial to the translucent zone. It is a positive zone as it is always present, shows positive birefringence in contrast to the sound enamel. Pore volume is 2 to 4% in polarized light. Presence of small pores, large molecules of quinoline are unable to diffuse through the pores or penetrate. This leads to the passage of light and air and appearance of the dark zone. The micro pore system gets filled with air and becomes dark. Medium like water may penetrate where it appears structureless. Body of lesion, it is present between unaffected surface and dark zone. This is the area of greatest demineralization. Pore volume is 5% in periphery and 25% in center. So there is a destruction or demineralization more in the center. Quinoline imbibition, body appears transparent. In water imbibition, positive birefringence compared to sound enamel. The stri of dredges become prominent. The surface zone, quantitative studies shows the partial mineralization of the surface zone, about 1 to 10% only. The pore volume is less than 5% of the spaces. Negative birefringence with water imbibition and positive birefringence with the porous subsurface. So the changes occurring, how it appears and why it appears in all the surfaces of the caries of enamel is very important and how to distinguish them the pore uh, size, which medium is used. These all are the important points when you're explaining the each surface. All the four zones of enamel caries cannot be seen with the same immersion medium. Caries of dentine. Caries in enamel is clearly dynamic process, but this tissue, uh, the dentine is uh, sorry, enamel is divide of cells and is therefore incapable of reacting in a vital manner because it is enamel is a non-vital tissue. While the dentine being a part of the dentine pulp complex, it is able to mount a reparative response. What happens when the caries of dentine begins at dentino enamel junction? There is a rapid involvement of great number of the dentinal tubules. The progression of caries along the dentine is through the dentinal tubules. It potential pathway leading to the dental pulp along with which microorganisms may travel at a variable rate of speed. Through the dentinal tubules, the progression of caries along with the microorganisms reaches the pulp. In some instances, caries invasion appears to occur through an enamel lamellae, as we have discussed earlier. Thus, when the lateral spread at dentino enamel junction takes place with the involvement of underlying dentine, a cavity of considerable size may form with only a slight clinically evident changes in the overlying enamel. Clinically, it might just appear as if a small pit or fissure, but it spreads along the dentino enamel junction laterally and further it leads to the cavitation or more destruction inside. Early changes. The initial penetration of dentine by caries may result in dentinal sclerosis. So this is going to be the first defensive response by the dentine. 
This dentinal sclerosis is a reaction of vital dentinal tubules and the vital pulp in which there is calcification of the dentinal tubules, which tend to seal them off against further penetration by the microorganisms. So this is the protective mechanism by the dentine. Whenever the caries is causing microorganisms um, travel through the dentinal tubules or they cause the destruction initial stage, the dentine pulp complex shows the immediate response as a sclerosis of the dentine over a period of time. The formation of sclerotic dentine is minimal in rapidly advancing caries. As the caries process spreads rapidly, the formation of sclerotic dentine will not occur as the caries process is more faster. But this phenomena is seen mainly in slow, long-standing chronic caries. By reflected light, the sclerotic dentine appears dark. The appearance of patty degeneration of odontoblastic process is seen with the deposition of the fat globules precedes even the early sclerotic dentine changes. The significance of this phenomena is not known, although it has been suggested that fat contributes to the impermeability of the dentinal tubules. So initially, it shows the fatty degeneration of the dentinal tubules and uh, it, uh, fat contributes to the impermeability of the dentinal tubules. It may be the predisposing factor favoring sclerosis of the dentinal tubules. So these are the early events occurring in the dental caries. Except in unusual cases of arrested caries, continued destruction of dentine inevitably occurs despite attempts at walling off one part of the tooth. The rate at which the carious destruction progresses leads to the slow, slower in older adults than in the younger ones. Because in older individuals, the progression of dentine is slower as there is a dentinal sclerosis as a part of aging process. The close examination of the dentine behind a zone of sclerosis formation in response to caries will reveal decalcification of the dentine, which appears to occur slightly in advance of the bacterial invasion of the tubules. In the earliest stages of the caries, when only few tubules are involved, microorganisms may be found penetrating these tubules. Even before the caries progression occurs to the entire thickness of the dentine along the dentinal tubules, first microorganisms penetrate the sterile dentinal tubules to cause the destruction. And these microorganisms have been termed as the pioneer bacteria. The initial decalcification of dentine involves the walls of the tubules, all of them to distend slightly as they become packed with masses of microorganisms and these organisms give a beaded appearance. So what are the pioneer bacteria? Enumerate them and why they are called so. Please note them down. Study of individual tubules will usually show almost pure forms of the bacteria. In each one tubule have a different forms, such as one dentinal tubule will be filled with the cocal forms, while the adjacent tubule might contain bacilli or thread forms. It is evident that the microorganisms, as they penetrate farther and farther into the dentine, they will be deprived or the carbohydrate supply to the microorganisms from the surface will be stopped. Okay, so the acidogenic bacteria which grow on the carbohydrate will be later replaced by the proteolytic or the microorganisms which causes the destruction of the protein content of the dentinal tubules will form. The high protein content of dentine would favor the growth of those microorganisms which have the ability to utilize this protein in their metabolism. So first, the acidogenic bacteria will traverse along the dentinal tubules. When they are deprived of the carbohydrate, as they penetrate deep, they will be deprived of the surface carbohydrate supply. So they will be replaced by the proteolytic microorganisms which will utilize the dentinal tubules to grow. 
Thus, the proteolytic organisms would appear to predominate in deeper caries of the dentine, while acidogenic forms are more prominent in early caries. The evidence indicates that the organisms responsible for initiation of caries are subsequently replaced by others as the environmental conditions occasioned by the advancing carious legion are altered. Advanced dentinal changes. The decalcification of the walls of individual tubules leads to their confluence. Although the general structure of organic matrix is maintained for some time. A thickening and swelling of the sheath of Newman, which is present surrounding the dentinal tubules occur. There will be increase in the diameter of the dentinal tubules due to packing of tubules by the microorganisms. These are all the changes occur. Tiny liquefaction foci as described by Miller are formed. These foci uh, fuse together and break down few dentinal tubules. This focus is an ovoid area of destruction parallel to the course of the dentinal tubules. They become filled with the necrotic debris, which tends to increase in size by expansion. This is the mechanism how the liquefaction foci increase in size and they expand and further leads to the collapse of the dentinal tubules. This process, this produces compression and distortion of the adjacent dentinal tubules in course and bent around the liquefaction focus. In areas of interglobular dentine, interglobular dentine is poorly mineralized dentine or this is less mineralized dentine. There is a decalcification and these areas confluence rapidly. A confluence of the dentinal tubules occurs rapidly. The presence of considerable amount of interglobular dentine accounts for the rapid spread of the caries in so-called malacotic or soft teeth. It has been pointed out that acidogenic organisms are apparently responsible for the initial decalcification of dentine occurring in the caries process but that another mechanism must be necessary for the ultimate destruction of remaining organic matrix. The most logical explanation is that this matrix is destroyed by the action of proteolytic enzymes produced by the microorganisms deep in the cavity. This enzymatic digestion is of maximal activity only when the organic matrix is decalcified. The destruction of dentine through a process of decalcification followed by proteolysis occurs at numerous focal areas, which eventually fuse to form, coalesce to form a necrotic mass of dentine of leathery consistency. These are the series of events how the dentinal tubules are destroyed and how the caries in dentine progresses. Clefts are rather common in this softened dentin, although they are more in chronic cases. These clefts extend at right angles to the dentinal tubules due to the extension of the carious process along the lateral branches of the dentinal tubules and along the matrix fibers, which run in this direction. These clefts parallel the incremental lines of the dentine, which are due to alternating resting periods during the calcification of dentine. The clefts account for the manner in which carious dentine can often be ex excavated by peeling away in thin layers with the hand instruments. So this is a caries of dentine showing the lateral branches of the dentinal tubules. These are the lateral branches of the dentinal tubules and which are filled with the microorganisms you can see here and these are the clefts. Typical transverse clefts. We'll just summarize the early dentinal caries and the series of events occurring. First, there will be fatty degeneration of the odontoblastic processes. There will be disposition of the fat globules, precedes early sclerotic changes. These uh, fat globules leads to the sclerotic dentine formation. Fat contributes to impermeability. 
predisposing factor for the dental sclerosis. So once the fatty degeneration of the odontoplastic process occurs, it leads to the formation of the second, that is the sclerotic dentine. It is the reaction of vital pulp leads to the calcification of the dentinal tubules, seals off the dentinal tubules from further penetration of the microorganisms. Minimal in rapidly advancing caries. When the progression of caries is rapid or fast, the formation of sclerotic dentine is slow. It is prominent in slow, long-standing and chronic caries. Sclerotic dentine appears white in transmitted light. Very commonly asked Viva was question, what is sclerotic dentine? Why it appears trans why it appears white in transmitted light? After this, decalcification of the dentinal tubules. Even when uh, the sclerotic dentine formation occurs, and the still further caries progresses, there will be the decalcification of the dentinal tubules. Above dentinal sclerosis, zone of decalcification occurs. It occurs in advance of bacterial invasion of dentinal tubules. It will be occupied by the pioneer bacteria. These are the bacteria which occupy the dentinal tubules even when the caries progression has not occurred. Initially, it is uh, it is traversed by the acidogenic bacteria which will be fed on the carbohydrate from the surface and later they will be replaced by the proteolytic microorganisms which are developed on uh, developed by the destruction of the protein from the dentinal tubules zone of microbial invasion proteolytic microorganisms are seen in the deeper and later stages of the dental caries these are predominantly in the deeper layers acidogenic microorganisms more in the early caries supporting the hypothesis that initiation and progression are two distinct distinct processes and must be differentiated as the carious lesion progresses, various zones of caries have been distinguished, which grossly tend to assume the shape of the triangle. Beginning pulpally at the advancing edge of the region, adjacent to these zones are adjacent to the normal dentine, these zones are as follow. The first zone being the zone of fatty degeneration of the odontoblastic processes. These are the zones very important to describe the dental caries. Second being the zone of dentinal sclerosis characterized by deposition of calcium salts in dentinal tubules. Zone three is zone of decalcification of dentine, a narrow zone preceding bacterial invasion. Zone 4 is a zone of bacterial invasion of decalcified but intact dentine. Zone 5 being the decomposed dentine. The secondary dentine, it is the dentine formed after the root formation is complete. So whenever there is an involvement of the secondary dentine, the carious involvement of secondary dentine does not differ remarkably that of the primary dentine, except that it is usually somewhat slower because the dentinal tubules are fewer in number and more irregular. They are not organized or they are not in uniform direction as in case of the primary dentine. So the penetration of the dentinal tubules by the bacteria is slower in this process, further which leads to the delayed demineralization of the tubules. The involvement of pulp results in ensuring inflammation and necrosis. Occasionally, caries will spread laterally at the junction of the primary and secondary dentine and produce a separation of the two layers. So advanced dentinal caries show the decalcification of the walls of dentinal tubules, which fuse together, thickening of the sheath of Newman along its course. There is an increase in the diameter of the dentinal tubules further leads to the pathway for the microorganisms. Focal coalescence of adjacent tubules and ovoid area of destruction by the liquefaction foci. The acidogenic microorganisms 
are involved in initial decalcification and the uh, further it is replaced by the proteolytic organisms which leads to the matrix destruction multiple areas of destruction occurs which leads to the necrotic mass of dentine altogether and give a consistency of leathery afterwards there will be formation of the transverse clefts along the dentinal tubules they extend at right angles to the dentinal tubules which will leads to it will uh, break down the dentinal tubules or weaken the dentinal tubules as uh, they are formed at right angle to the dentinal tubules whenever there is a mechanical force put on the tooth these are these act as the area of weakness peeling away of the carious dentine. So these are the sequence of events occurring in the dentinal caries. So CM Dental Academy at present is working on these three courses and we are going to shortly begin with this uh, classes for uh, dental materials, second BDS students there will be online classes the recordings of the classes you can access anytime targeted revision will be there at end of the uh, uh, course there will be online notes viva was questions mcqs will be provided for all the subjects in case of oral pathology and dental histology histological slides will be discussed there will be a free library access for uh, even oral pathology, dental anatomy, and dental histology. These are the courses we are going to begin. Other subject courses are also uh, there in CM Academy. You can avail the best offer and take advantage of the course. Thank you.